Is apostasy in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 a reference to apostasy in the last days or to the rapture of the church? Does the Jewish use of the word apostasia in the centuries prior to the New Testament era shed any light on the meaning and significance of apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3? Stay tuned for the results of my research on this matter. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth. Truth at any cost. Truth above every other consideration. Now, let's just turn right to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and read it. There we read, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The word translated falling away in the King James Version is the Greek word apostasia. So is apostasia here a reference to apostasy in the last days, or is it a reference to the rapture of the church prior to the tribulation? I am confident that the evidence points convincingly to the understanding of apostasy. Sadly, a lot of the information that's available that could have been and should have been brought to the table for this discussion on the meaning of apostasia was left out of the discussion. It was left out in the cold. This video is intended to remedy this lack on one point. The Jewish usage of the word apostasia prior to the time that Paul penned his letters to the Thessalonians. He penned his first letter probably somewhere around the year 49 or 51, and he penned his second letter probably late in the year 51. Well, let's begin our investigation of the use of the Greek word apostasia in the Koine era prior to the writing of the New Testament by reviewing for a moment the historical grammatical hermeneutic. As I mentioned in an earlier video in this series, we have an obligation to diligently pursue a robust implementation of the historical grammatical hermeneutic in our efforts to understand the Bible. A key axiom of this vital approach to understanding the Bible is that the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, and that the vocabulary of the New Testament is Koine vocabulary used in common senses that were current in the centuries prior to the writing of the New Testament. We are not free to wave our magic wand and invent senses of the Greek word apostasia, or any Greek word for that matter, that didn't occur in Koine Greek. A subset of this axiom is that many of the theological, moral, and uh, eschatological terms employed in the New Testament find their inspiration and their nuance in the Jewish use of the Koine Greek in the Septuagint and in their own religious writings. The New Testament, after all, was penned by Jews who were steeped in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and they were steeped in their own religious writings. So, that is the influence of the Greek language on their religious vocabulary. Now, all of these uses that we're going to find in the New Testament are well within the range of Koine Greek, but they often have an elevated and a narrowed sense that's focused on the true God and on the people of God and on the temple of God. Well, let's now look at the use of apostasia in the Septuagint. Uh, this word appeared three times in the Septuagint in the sense of religious apostasy. Second Chronicles 29.19, it is used of um, Ahaz's apostasy. His tragic tale told in the 28th and 29th chapters of Second Chronicles uh, informs us that he led the nation of Israel down a path of apostasy, down a disastrous path uh, that ended up 
with the destruction of the articles in the temple of God, uh, with the barring of the temple of God, with sacrificing to the gods of Damascus, erecting, well, erecting altars on all the corners in Jerusalem, and building high places in every city. In Joshua 22.22, apostasia is used of the feared apostasy of the Transjordanian tribes who had built an altar of witness, and the other tribes feared that this was actually an altar for sacrifice and that it had been raised in competition to the one and only true altar in Jerusalem. In Jeremiah 2.19, apostasia is used for the departure of Israel from the Lord. Uh, Israel had changed the glory of God for who, who literally dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem for gods that were no gods at all. Even the gods of Egypt and Assyria. Israel forsook the fountain of living waters and went and hewn, hewed for herself cisterns that couldn't hold water. Now, in all three of these instances, apostasia is used in reference to Israel's departure from the temple of God and from the Holy One who dwelt in that temple. And these men would then invent their own ways of worship. So all of these accounts foreshadow the apostasy of the Antichrist in the last days. Well, let's examine now the use of apostasy in the Jewish extra-biblical writings. Apostasia appears twice in these extra-biblical writings, at least for the ones that are extant. We find it used in 1 Maccabees, and we find it used in the Book of Jubilees. Both of these books were very popular at the time of Christ. There were more copies of Jubilees found at Qumran than any book of the Hebrew Bible except for Psalms, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Exodus. There were 15 copies found of Jubilees, which is the same number of copies that were found of the book of Genesis. Now, the reference in 1 Maccabees 2.15 concerns the occasion when the officers of Antiochus Epiphanes were forcing the Jews to commit apostasy by forsaking the law of God and sacrificing to Zeus. We read there, the king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy came to the city of Modin to make them sacrifice. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes had already ransacked the temple and, how, and had already polluted it with hog's blood. Fully aware that he was operating against the law of Moses, and now he was requiring the Jews to commit apostasy by sacrificing to a foreign god. Now, this awful trial was predicted in the 11th chapter of Daniel, where Antiochus in the forced apostasy are presented as types of the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation in the last days. There's no religious Jew in the early church could have read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, with its mention of apostasia and not have his mind drift to the apostasia in the book of Maccabees and have his mind correlate between Antiochus Epiphanes and the Antichrist, between Antiochus Epiphanes' abomination of desolation and the abomination of desolation that's going to be committed by the Antichrist in the last days. The reference in the Book of Jubilees, which is in Fragment Z, 10.21 and 10.24, says, When they had been building for 40 years, Nimrod in particular urging them to apostasy. Now, in this context, Nimrod is presented as leading the entire world in apostasy. Um, building the Tower of Babel, or Babel, was a symbol of the world's unity in rebellion against the true God. And Nimrod is really the spirit of Babylon, and he is the, the source of all the post-flood apostasy of mankind against the living and true God. Now, this Babylonian or Nimrodian spirit is going to be manifested in the last days in its fullest, deepest, darkest degree in the time of the Antichrist. Again, I would have to observe that there's no way any religious Jew in the early uh, 
in, in the New Testament era of the church would able would be able to read 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 about the apostasia in the last days and not have his mind turn to Nimrod's situation where Nimrod committed apostasia. They're going to be correlated. They're, whoever reads that is going to have his mind go back and connect Paul's treatment of apostasy in the Antichrist with Nimrod's apostasia and him being a type of the Antichrist. Well, let's take up for a moment the background to Paul's use of apostasia. It's difficult to imagine Paul writing about the apostasy associated with the Antichrist and not having in mind the instances of apostasia in the Septuagint. These passages portray Israel rejecting the worship of the true God in the temple and turning to the worship of false gods at unsanctioned altars and high places. And this is the same iniquity that's engaged in the last days by the Antichrist, except that the Antichrist actually goes beyond this and sits in the temple and declares himself God and demands to be worshipped. A man demanding worship as God. It is even more difficult to imagine Paul writing about the apostasia associated with the Antichrist and not having in mind the instances of apostasia in 1 Maccabees and in the Book of Jubilees. Both of these men, both Nimrod in Jubilees and Antiochus Epiphanes in 1 Maccabees, are types of the Antichrist. And both of these men force mankind around them into acts of apostasy that foreshadow the apostasy of the last days. When the man of sin is going to lead the whole world into rebellion against the living God and require them to worship him as God. The bottom line is there is no doubt in my mind that Paul, indeed the Holy Spirit, consciously, conscientiously, and intelligently employed the Greek word apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Because this word, better than any other Greek word that could have been employed, points readers to the heinousness and the iniquity of the spiritual departure in the last days. It drew his original readers' minds to the great types of the Antichrist in Jewish literature. Nimrod with his unified world in Babel, and Antiochus Epiphanes with his abomination of desolation. And the Antichrist of the last days is going to fill the world with the spirit of Babel. He's going to complete what Nimrod started, and he's going to fulfill the typology of Antiochus Epiphanes. So in conclusion, the Jewish use of the word apostasia sheds significant light on the meaning of apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Apostasia is associated with sacrifice and worship directed to false gods. Apostasia is associated with the type, the, actually the two types of the Antichrist, Nimrod and Antiochus Epiphanes. So I trust that this survey of the use of apostasia in Jewish literature will, has helped you to see, or perhaps to see more clearly, that understanding apostasia in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 as a reference to the last day's apostasy associated with the Antichrist is not only reasonable, but is by far the most probable understanding. Eyes wide open. Brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.